Welcome to another episode of Mike's Money Fix. Today on the podcast, we are kicking off Masters Week. It is one of my favorite sporting events on the calendar. Actually, it's probably my second favorite sporting event that happens yearly behind only March Madness. And it's kind of fitting that as March Madness ends, Masters Week begins. So this is one of my favorite weeks of the year. And we're going to have a lot of content coming your way here at Mike's Money Picks. This is the first of that. This is quite possibly our most ambitious episode ever. This is our 2024 Masters player by player breakdown, where we are going to talk about all 88 of the golfers that are currently in the field next week at Augusta National. And we're going to give you kind of an overview of what their history has been at Augusta, what their recent form is like coming in this tournament, and what their general strengths and weaknesses are as a golfer in order to handicap whether or not they are likely to play well next week at Augusta National. Now, like I said, 88 players. It's quite a lot. This is going to be a little bit of a lengthy episode, but we are going to give you everything you need to know about all these players. If you are more accustomed to our more regular previews where we break down the course, where we dive into a custom model, where we talk about plays in DFS and one and done, that will still be coming. The course preview episode will likely be coming out Monday night, and then we are going to have a live stream either Tuesday or Wednesday night where we're going to break down more of the games like DFS, betting, one and done, player props, whatever, and it's going to be a live stream so you guys can hop in the live chat and ask questions and give your input as well. But like I said, this is a big week of content for us here at Mike's Money Picks. This is one of my favorite weeks of the year, so that's going to be um, indicative of the content that comes out. Now, if you have not already, if you're watching on YouTube, please go ahead and subscribe to the channel. That way you can be with us for the rest of the content here for Masters Week and for the rest of the PGA Tour season. Um, and you will also be notified when we begin that live stream, whether it ends up being Tuesday or Wednesday night. That is still to be determined based off of my schedule. So if you're subscribed, you'll know when that happens. If you're listening on audio, go ahead and subscribe to that audio feed. That way you'll get all these episodes as soon as they drop. You will still get the um, live stream episode. It'll just be the audio cut of it as opposed to um, you know, the, the audio and video, obviously. Um, but if you're subscribed, you will know when those drop right away. And do me a favor, a lot of research, a lot of work went into this show. If you want to show some appreciation for that, make sure you hit that like button on YouTube. Make sure you um, hit the rate and review button on audio. Um, and those help me out more than you guys could ever know. I really do appreciate it and really does help out a ton. Now, Let's go ahead and dive into the 88 player field of the Masters. Although I'm recording this while the Valero Texas Open is still going on. So if my guy Akshay Batia does in fact end up winning the Valero Texas Open, he will play his way into the Masters and that will make 89. And if you're a long-term listener of the show, you know my thoughts on Akshay. I'm going to be playing Akshay in DFS if he does end up winning this tournament. I'm probably going to lose so much money on Akshay next week if he wins. But hey, it'll be because I won money on Akshay this week because I had him in a lot of my DFS lineups and I even had an outright slip on Akshay to win. So um you know, even if I end up losing next week because of Akshay, I, I did win this week because of Akshay, so it's okay. Anyway, let's go ahead and dive into the field itself. We are going to go in order of DraftKings pricing for each player, and there's going to be a couple guys that I do group together where I go a little bit out of order, but it's because there's guys where they kind of have similar traits, similar um, overviews, and so because it's an 88-player episode, I don't want to repeat myself too much. All right, so let's go ahead and dive in with the top of the board, and that is Mr. Scott. All right, so it should come as no surprise that we are kicking this off with Scotty Scheffler. He is, objectively speaking, the best golfer in the world. Like whatever ranking system you want to go by, whatever sort of merits you want to give to recent form, um, you know, year-long form, whatever, he's the best golfer in the world. And, and it's no surprise that he is the favorite to win this golf tournament here this week at Augusta National. Now, when it comes to his history at Augusta, he's been pretty spectacular at it. He's played it four times and he's never finished worse than 20th. Um, and really last year represented like, in my opinion, rock bottom, like his TD green game was outstanding, but he lost over four strokes putting for the tournament and still finished T10. In fact, it's actually very similar TD green play in 2023 that he had when he won the masters in 2022. It's just the putter that let him down a little bit along with a little bit of the chipping, which separated him from that win and that T10 performance. Now his recent form is simply the best out of anybody on the planet. His last three starts have been a win, a win and a T2 at the Houston open where he had a putt on the 72nd hole that would have forced a playoff. In fact, he's actually gained strokes putting in his last three starts. And that's normally been the weakness for Scotty Scheffler. And so now you have the best TD Green player in the world who is now turning into an above average putter and it should be scary for the rest of the field. He is rightly the favorite to win this tournament and I believe he is by far the most likely offer to win this tournament. What he is doing from a TD Green perspective right now cannot be understated. He has gained at least 10 strokes TD Green in his last three starts which is just unheard of and he gained at least six strokes 
total to the field in every single start this year with a floor of T17 at the American Express, which was, as John Rahm would call it, a, a putting contest, among other words. So um, I, I just really like how this sets up for Scotty Scheffler. Also, what I think is worth noting, just from an eye test perspective, Scotty Scheffler is a very good course manager. He knows the right spots to miss. He knows how to leave himself in good situations with good putts in good spots. And to me, that is vital around Augusta where you're looking at a course that is so firm and fast. that has got so much undulation, so much hills and hollows and, and difficult areas to get up and down from and difficult pin locations to attack. He is going to be putting himself in a good position every time. And to me, that is worth a lot as well. I really, really cannot say enough about how well this tournament sets up for Scotty Scheffler. Next up, let's go ahead and take a look at John Rahm. He is second in DraftKings pricing, and he has been um, a little bit of an enigma this season. His history at Augusta, though, is, is very good. He has never finished outside of the top 30 at Augusta, and that even includes when he played it as an amateur in 2017 when he finished T27, um, and he is obviously the defending champ coming in. Now, no one has defended their title at Augusta since 1990 um, when Nick Faldo did it, so this is not exactly like a great history for defending champs, but if anybody were to do it, it could be John Rahm because of how good he's been at this tournament. He has three top fives in seven appearances at Augusta National. And in fact, in his last three trips to Augusta National, he has gained strokes in all categories, T to green and with the putter. So that's just a really good resume for a guy who, um, you know, is just one of the best golfers in the world when he is on. Now, the question is, is he currently on? Well, on live this season, he's played four times and finished T3, 8th, 5th, and T8, pending the result of, um, you know, live at Miami this weekend. And I don't really know what to make that live is just such a hard like tour to handicap because they are playing pretty much in isolation. There's no cut. There's there. It's really, uh, people are going to get mad at me at this, but it's really kind of an exhibition where it doesn't really, really matter if they win or not, because they're not really playing for anything except for money, which they already have. So um, it's really hard to handicap what um, John Rahm has been doing on live. Now I, I say this as somebody who does in fact, enjoy watching live, but it's just really hard to quantify what they've done. What I can say about John Rahm though, is that in the swing season, he did play on the DP world tour three times and finished fourth T9 and T5 and looked pretty solid T to green in all those starts. So um, John Rahm, good master's history, good major's history. Recent form is a little bit of an unknown and the defending champion angle is a little bit of a red flag, but John Rahm definitely deserving of being the second price golfer on the DraftKings board. Now we got to talk about Rory McIlroy. So um, his history at the Masters has been quite checkered. He has famously never won this event and only needs this event to, to cap off the career grind. So I'm, you're probably going to hear that about a hundred times this week. And his history here has been up and down. Like, you know, in um, 2011, he, he entered the final round with the lead and ended T15. In 2016, he entered the third round tied for the lead and finished T10. In his last three starts at the Masters, he was runner up the year Scotty Scheffler won it but that is sandwiched by a missed cut in 2023 and 2021. So this is just a little bit of an up and down history for Rory. And he has not had a tournament at Augusta where he, or I'm sorry, he has not had a tournament this year in, on American soil where he gained strokes in all four categories. So just you're looking at Rory and he's got up and down um, master's history, up and down recent form. Um, and he's really just been incredibly inconsistent with his irons. You don't really know what direction they're going to go in this year for Rory. So um, to me, there's a lot of red flags around Rory. But he is still Rory McIlroy. He is still one of the best drivers of the golf ball in the world. He is still one of the best players in the world. And it's just really like I don't really know how to handicap him coming in this tournament other than saying that. And there's a lot of guys that I'm going to say that about this week because this is, in my opinion, outside of Scotty Chef for a really hard tournament to handicap. So with Rory, though, he's like kind of the opposite of Scotty Scheffler, where Scotty Scheffler is Mr. Conservative when it comes to course management, and Rory is Mr. Aggressive when it comes to course management. He is going to fire at pins. He's going to make some bad decisions, and that has always reared its ugly head with him at Augusta. So I don't really know what to make of Rory this week. Um, one key stat that I'm going to talk about on the course breakdown show tomorrow is bogey avoidance. And he actually ranks near the bottom of the PGA tour at bogey avoidance. So I do think it'll be interesting to see how he finishes up at Valero this week to see if I can get maybe a little more interested in playing Rory McIlroy. Now Brooks Kepka is a guy that just pretty much whenever he tees it up at the majors, you just play Brooks Kepka. It's that simple. In fact, at the Masters, the last three times he has played the event when healthy, he has finished T2, T7, T2. You know, you can throw out 2021 and the start of 2022 because Brooks just was not healthy that year, right? And so really – 
I think it's only a matter of time before he wins a Masters. Like Scotty Scheffler, he is a very conservative manager of the course who just finds a way in majors to hit fairways, hit greens. He knows when to attack. He knows when to get aggressive. And the biggest thing with Brooks to me is like, He's just Mr. Major Championship, right? Like, like his record in majors speaks for itself having five majors, um, which is the more of anybody in the field except for Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson, I believe, who are like over 40. So I do think that this speaks to just his ability to show up when the lights are the brightest and when he's playing in major championships. Now with Brooks, you can just throw out recent form. Anybody who you listen to content this week that talks about Brooks kept his recent form, throw it out. Don't pay any attention to it because even when he was on the PGA tour and not playing on live, you never really went off of Brooks's recent form. You just knew that when the majors come around, he was going to be there. He was going to be playing his best golf, and he was going to have a chance to win that tournament. And that is pretty much how I see it with Brooks Kepka this week. I think he is probably one of the better bets to win this tournament in this entire field. Now, Wyndham Clark is a very unique situation. He is a debutant at Augusta National. He has never played the Masters before, but yet he is actually the defending U.S. Open champion and owns two other victories on the PGA Tour in elevated events. In fact, in the last um, three tournaments that he's played, he had two tournaments where he was runner-up and only lost to Scotty Scheffler. It's pretty impressive. He's been playing really good golf in 2023. In my opinion, he's probably uh, had the best 2023 of any PGA golfer not named Scotty Scheffler. Um, and so I, I really do think that Wyndham Clark is a really solid bet to win this tournament. And, you know, he may be a debutante at Augusta, and no debutante has won this event since Fuzzy Zeller in 1979. That's another stat that you're probably going to hear a thousand times this week. But, you know, if any debutante were to win it, it would be a guy like Wyndham Clark, who has already won a major, who has already won two elevated events. And in general, I think his game sets up really well for Augusta. He's really long off the tee. He's really good with long irons in his hand. And he's got a really solid short game that's, you know, capped off by a really good putter. And so, you know, if he is able to, you know, bring his entire game to Augusta, he's going to have a chance to win. Do not be totally scared of the debutante na narrative. Yes, no debutante has won since 1979, but last year Sahit Tagawa finished ninth in 2014, Jordan Spieth was runner-up. In 2020, Sung J M was runner-up. And in 2021, Will Zalatoris was runner-up. So guys have been knocking at the door in their first trip to Augusta. Just nobody has broken through for that win, and it could be Wyndham Clark. Next up, we've got Xander Shoffley, who um, has three top tens and a missed cut at Augusta National since 2019. However, what's really impressive about Xander is he has finished top 20 in the last seven major tournaments. That is quite impressive. And to me, he is the best recent form of anybody who has not won in this calendar year. You know, when, when you have golf and, and, you know, people talk about golf from a winner's perspective, there's always the duality of winning, right? A guy like Xander Shoffley gets crushed for getting close and not winning. But yet, Yet at the same time, you know, there's other guys that, you know, finish T30 every week that no one ever crushes because they're, they're not close to winning, right? And so um, with Xander, I think he is knocking on the door. His history at Augusta, his history of majors is great. It, it's only a matter of time before he wins one. And he is coming in with better form right now than he quite possibly has in any of the majors that he's played in the last two years. I think he's a virtual lock to finish top 20. And I do think if Xander were to ever win a Masters, this would be a good opportunity. Now, Joaquin Neiman is like the opposite of Xander Shoffley because all he has done on Live this season is win. Um, he won at Live Mayakoba. He won at Live Jetta. In fact, he even won in the swing season at the Australian Open. So everything shapes up well for how Joaquin Neiman has been playing recently, and everybody is praising him for those wins. However, what nobody wants to talk about is his finish at the Masters is quite dreadful. Um, he's only played the Masters four times. He's finished 16th, 35th, 40th, and had a missed cut. Um, but like... That's kind of him at all majors. He only has one top 20 finish in all of the majors out of all of them that he's played. So like I said, he's like the opposite of Xander Shoffley, whereas Xander never wins and finishes top 20 at all the majors. Joaquin Neiman is winning all the time right now and has not played well at any of the majors. What I do think shapes up well for Joaquin Neiman, though, is that he does um, hit more of a draw off the tee, which we have seen historically. There's been a little bit of a draw bias at Augusta. However, in recent years with Scotty Scheffler, um, Dustin Johnson, Hideki Matsuyama, and John Rahm winning, those are all guys who fade the golf ball. So that narrative has been broken a little bit. But Joaquin Neiman, if you were to ever break through for his first big time major performance, it could be this week at a go. That's the national. Next up is Victor Hovland, who um, finished T7 in last year's Masters, which was his best finish. Um, he was the low amateur at the 2019 Masters, won by Tiger Woods when he finished T32. Um, I got to say, though, if you asked me in December about 
um, Victor Hovland's prospects, I would have said he was one of the best picks to win this tournament. He was elite um, to finish up the PGA Tour season in, in the fall of 2023. But since the calendar rolled over to 2024, he has not been great. Um, he has not finished in the top 15 of any event in the calendar year 2024. His chipping game has been particularly bad, and he actually fired his short game coach, and it got worse. So to me, that's a major red flag at a course where um, the short game is super important at Augusta National, and his irons have not been the same scorching hot that he was to end 2023. So to me, there are a lot of red flags surrounding Victor Hovland here this week. Speaking of red flags, let's talk about Patrick Cantlay. So, you know, everything that I said about Victor Hovland kind of applies for Patrick Cantlay. He was great in the FedEx Cup playoffs, finishing fifth at the Tour Championship. Um, his best finish this year was a T4 at the Genesis Invitation, where he led through the first, second, and third rounds and did not close it at all on Sunday. Since then, he's been pretty poor on approach at the players and the Arnold Palmer Invitational, which is normally the strength of his game. At the Masters, um, his history is kind of up and down. Um, he's only had one top 10 at this tournament. Um, and putting, which is generally his strength on the golf course, has failed him at Augusta. He's lost over three strokes putting in each of the last three Masters. So Patrick Cantlay is another guy that I'm just not that interested in this week. Jordan Spieth is... Quite the exact opposite, though. He is Mr. Augusta National. Um, you know, he since his win in 2015, um, he has had five other top five finishes, um, you know, which started with a runner up in his debut in 2014. Um, and so just pretty much every time he teased up at Augusta, you got to consider Jordan Speed. He is just Mr. Course History here at a course where course history matters quite a lot. Now, his recent form has been. Not spectacular. Um, you know, there's a big DQ next to his name for the Genesis Invitational, but um, he was actually in the top 20 at that tournament when he withdrew. So I do think that there will be a little bit different perspective on him if we had a good result from that tournament. But he was quite bad at the players and at the Valspar. He's currently, you know, kind of sniffing around at the Valero Texas Open, uh, making a lot of birdies, making a lot of bogeys, as Jordan Speed does. But anytime Jordan Speed is at Augusta National, he has to be in consideration because of that elite, elite level course history. Now, speaking of elite course history, Will Zalatoris. He does not quite have the sample size that Jordan Speed does, but he's played Augusta National twice and finished second and sixth and actually gained strokes in both categories in both of those appearances. And his approach play, which is normally his weakness was really, or I'm sorry, which is normally his strength, was really not that great when he finished sixth. He was very close to being neutral to the field. His putter, which is normally his weakness, has been his strength at Augusta, where he's gained over five strokes putting in both appearances. Will Zalatoris has a little Brooks Kepka to him where you just always play him at the majors. You play him at long, difficult golf courses. You, you know, it, I think it's only a matter of time before a guy like Will Zalatoris, who always seems to play his best at major championships, ends up winning one of them outright. All right, so that does it for the first 10 golfers. So let's take ourselves a little bit of a breather, and then we're going to talk about the next group. Sitting behind Wyndham Clark on the list of debutantes most likely to win Augusta National sits Ludwig Aubert, who is just – really good at golf and really young and got a super bright future ahead of him. Um, he has had five straight top 25 finishes on the PGA Tour, which is surely to become sixth pending the result of the Valero Texas Open. He is one of the best off the tee players in the world. He's really long, really accurate. As we mentioned on the Valero Texas Open podcast, he's technically been longer off the tee than Rory McIlroy and more accurate than Colin Morikawa, which is just an insane combination to think about because we think of Rory as being super long, Morikawa as being super accurate, and Ludwig is better than both. That driver is going to give him a pretty good opportunity to win any tournament he's in and he's actually gained strokes on approach in every tournament this calendar year except for one so if he's able to ball strike like he has been Ludwig Aubert does have a shot to win this tournament as a debutante Next up is Hideki Matsuyama, who um, is a guy that historically I haven't played in DraftKings a lot. I haven't picked to win tournaments a lot just because he's very, very up and down. But right now, he's up. He won at the Genesis Invitational, followed by a T12 at the Arnold Palmer Invitational, and a T6 at the Players, and is playing well at the Valero Texas Open. Um, he has always been a very good around the green and approach player, and right now his driver and his putter are cooperating to give him a very well-rounded game at the moment. He's also a guy who has a pretty good history at the Masters. He won the tournament in 2021 and has followed that up with a T14 and a T16 finish, where he lost strokes on the green pretty significantly in both of those tournaments. So I just think everything is shaping up well for Hideki. The, the performance at the players where he finished T6 was statistically the best ball striking on off the T plus, plus approach week of his entire career. So, you know, you're getting Hideki at his absolute peak right now, and it would not shock me if he puts on the green jacket a second time. Believe it or not, it, the Masters is actually pretty friendly to guys who have won the tournament before and come back to win it later in their career as opposed to winning it back-to-back. -back. Hideki and Scotty Scheffler would fit that trend. 
Now for the next two, I'm going to group together Cameron Smith and Dustin Johnson, just because to me, they're the two biggest enigmas in this field. I genuinely have no idea of how good either of these guys is going to play because they pretty much went to live, got the bag, haven't played all that well on live. They've, they've had their moments, they've had their wins, but generally they, they're very up and down and they weren't great in the masters last year. But the good news is, is that they both have really good histories here. Dustin Johnson, in fact, um, won the 2020 November Masters. But since, he's been quite mediocre. He missed the cut in his defense in 2021, finished 12th in um, 2022, and 48th in 2023. Um, and also, he only had one top 10 in a major last year. It was T10 at Los Angeles Country Club. Now, also with DJ is like, we know that his driver and his long iron game can be world class. But is it right now? I have serious doubts. Cam Smith is a guy who has great history at Augusta. He finished runner-up to DJ in 2020 and has followed that up with a T10, a T3, and a T34. His short game and his putter are world-class. But is it world-class right now? I have serious doubts. Last year, Cam Smith did also have his best performance in a major at LACC, which was a T4. And I got to be honest, LACC tomorrow is going to show up as one of my comp courses for this event. Keep in mind, that event was won by Wyndham Clark. So I do think that Cam Smith and Dustin Johnson, there's there's a little bit of hope that you can get, but that they are truly enigmas coming into this tournament because of the obscurity of what they've done on live. Now, Justin Thomas is kind of like Rory McIlroy Light. His history here is just an enigma. Um, you know, he missed the cut last year, but be, prior to that, he had a eighth place finish and a fourth place finish in two of the last four editions of the Masters, and he had not missed a cut until last year. So he's been pretty consistent here. Now he has been very up and down in 2024. He started out the tournament red hot with a T3 at the American Express and T6 at Pebble, but his last two tournaments have been a Missed cut at the players and a T64 at the Dallas bar, which um, he's just been quite bad. And he's also replacing his caddy, which can be, I mean, it can be hit or miss. There's guys that play really well in their first week with a new caddy. There's guys that don't. Sometimes it clicks, sometimes it doesn't. I don't really know what to make of it. What I do know about Justin Thomas, though, is aside from all the question marks, there is one discernible skill that he has, and that is that he is a great chipper of the golf ball from short grass lies, of which there are going to be a lot of this week. And so Justin Thomas, you know, no matter what else happens, he's got that skill that he can back on. Next up, we got to talk about Tony Finau, who has an underrated major championship history. He has never missed the cut here at Augusta. He has finished in the top 40 in six straight appearances here at this club. Um, and then two of which were top, or I'm sorry, three of which were top tens um, in 2021 and 2019 and 2018. Now his ball striking right now is as good as it has ever been in his career. It's just been the putter that lets him down. But when you look at his history of putting at Augusta National, he's been pretty neutral as a putter. And he's a guy who, like Justin Thomas, has a verifiably good short game. So if Tony Finau can marry his recent ball striking with his historic putting at Augusta, he has the profile of somebody who could absolutely win this golf tournament. Speaking of winning golf tournaments, Cameron Young is a guy who has not won on the PGA Tour yet in his career, which seems amazing. But he has a guy that, in my, he's a guy that, in my opinion, has the game to win at Augusta. He missed the cut in his debut at 2022, but it came back next or last year to finish T7, and it was doing what Cam Young does, being elite off the tee, treading water with his irons and his wedges, and being above average with the putter. That is the formula for Cameron Young, and that is what he did when he finished second at the Valspar in a tournament that he very easily could have won. His approach play recently has actually been at the best point it's been in his career, so I really do like how everything shapes up for Cam Young. And I, like Will Zalatoris, I think it's only a matter of time time before he ends up winning a major championship. Now, Colin Morikawa has won two major championships, but his game right now and his appearances at Augusta are, are not anything to bank on. And at Augusta National, he has never missed a cut, but he also only owns one top five finish in 2022, 10th, 18th, and 44th were the other three appearances. His accuracy off the tee is normally his strength, but he has not been all that great off the tee recently. Um, and his approach play has not been all that great recently. So you're talking about a guy who his two strengths have not been his strengths this calendar year. He's also a guy that I have concerns about how he plays Augusta National. He is at his blessed when, when he has flat lies and when he's able to hit a lot of greens. And Augusta National is not going to be the case for either of those stats. So Kyle Morikawa is a guy I have serious doubts about. However, he has kind of came out of nowhere to win two majors in the past without really a whole lot of recent form coming in. And played well 
well at the 2022 U.S. Open without a lot of recent form coming in. So I do think that there's an opportunity here for Morikawa, but nothing in the stats recently points to it. Max Homa is a guy who has been mired in major championship mediocrity in his entire career. He has finished no better than 43rd at Augusta National, missing the cut in two of his four appearances. In fact, he only owns one top 10 in a major championship in his career, which was T10 at the Open this past year. So could this be the year for Max to finally turn it around? I don't know. His recent form has been quite up and down. He was 8th at the Arnold Palmer and 16th at the Genesis, but he missed the cut in Phoenix. T64 at the players. He's just been really inconsistent. His major championship history is certainly nothing to write home about. Bryson DeChambeau is a guy who is, to me, a, a very solid pick to win multiple major championships in his career, but not at Augusta National. He has never finished inside the top 20 at Augusta National in seven tries, and he has missed the cut in his last two trips. The lead-in form that he has to this year's master, though, is better than last year's. He was great in the fall on Live, um, and then you know he's been pretty good on Live this season with a T9 in Las Vegas, fourth at Jeddah, and T6 at Hong Kong. But I just don't really think he's a guy who's ever going to win at Augusta. He's kind of a robot golfer. Like Colin Morikawa, he is at his best when he has flat lies when he is able to take advantage of his driver off the tee. And, and usually he's actually better when everybody's playing out of the rough because he's going to hit it farther into the rough than everybody else does. So I just don't think this course is a really good spot for Bryson at all, but I do think that his game is in a very good spot coming in. All right, that does it for group number two. So we're going to take a quick breather before heading on to group. So next up, we have Sam Burns, who is a very similar profile to Max Homa in that he's a talented player who has a discernible strength, which is his putter, but he has never played well in a major, and he has never played well at Augusta National. He's only played it twice and has missed the cut and finished 29th. However, that putter has been really good for him recently, and so maybe if, if he could play well with his putter and his irons do show up, which they have in six straight events, he could have a chance, but... I mean, you're asking a lot of a guy who's never really played well in a major and never really played well at this course. Next up is Shane Lowry, who is also kind of like Tony Finau, deceptively good in major championships. His game ends up elevating itself in difficult conditions, particularly if the weather gets nasty. And his history at Augusta National is not bad. Um, you know, his two best finishes at Augusta have been in the past two years. He was third in 2022 and 16th in 2023, which have made it now four straight top 25 finishes at this tournament. Now, we know with Shane that he's going to be great with the driver. He's going to be great with the short game. But what's interesting is his approach play has been really, really good recently. And if he can just marry all that together, you know, the form at Augusta with his recent ball striking and have a decent week with the putter, he can actually, you know, contend here this week. He just has to check all those boxes. And he's a guy that can do that, but he's a guy that I particularly like more if we look at the weather forecast and it's looking like nasty weather. That just to me says Shane Lowry every single time. Next up, we have Matt Fitzpatrick, who has been better at Augusta National. He finished 14th and 10th in his last two Masters, which also coincides with the time where he started adding distance off the tee. He was never a long player until the start of the 2022 season, but since he did that, that allowed him to win that um, his first major at the U.S. Open in 2022. And, you know, his most recent form, you know, he's playing decently well at the Valero Texas Open right now, but his most recent tournament was a fifth place finish at the Players, where um, I don't know if you, you guys may have seen this or not, but there was an article that was written where he apparently had a training weight put in his driver and, and was playing terribly with it. The stats bear that out. Um, and at the Players' Championship, he remembered it and had it removed and had the best driving week that he has had in pretty much the last calendar year. So definitely a guy that I think, you know, that definitely elevates his ceiling a little bit. And, and you know, he, he has a deceptively good history to Gusta. I definitely don't mind Matt Fitzpatrick here this week. Now, Brian Harmon, you know, he does check a few boxes at Augusta National. You know, he has won a major championship at the Open last year. He is a lefty. He played his college golf at the University of Georgia. So he has all that going for him. But he is just not long off the tee. And this tournament lends itself to guys who are very long off the tee. He's played the tournament five times best finish was a T12 in 2021, but has missed the cut in two years since. His recent form has been very up and down. He was T12 at Arnold Palmer and T2 at the players, but then followed it up with a missed cut at the Valspar. He just, he tends to play best at his courses where distance is not emphasized. And this is one that does emphasize distance. So I don't think this is a great fit for Brian Harmon. Jason Day is up next, who um, finished 39th in his edition of the tournament last year, which was preceded by two missed cuts. Jason Day, kind of like Ricky Fowler and Jordan Speed, had a year or two where he was just 
terrible. And he really bounced back for a big 2023 capped off with a win at the Byron Nelson, but he has been pretty bad since that win. You know, at the start of this calendar year, he did have a T six at Pebble and a ninth place finish at the Genesis invitation where he had a very well-rounded game, but his approach play seems to have left him since then losing strokes in all three events since those two tournaments. And it's just a really hard sell for me knowing that the guy had better form coming in last year and only finished 39th and his form this year is nowhere near that good. Now, a guy that I think will eventually win the Masters in his life is Sahid Thagawa. Reason why? Well, he came in ninth last year where he gained strokes in all four categories. Really good sign. That was his debut, and he was the low debutante last year. To me, he possesses a game that is very similar to Jordan Spieth, except he is longer off the tee. Sahid Thagawa is long off the tee, tends to miss it a little bit, but that's not necessarily a big detriment at Augusta. He can get superbly hot with his irons, which is what you will need to win Augusta. And he also has a great short game long-term. However, recently his short game has been a little bit below his baseline. So if you're looking at recent form numbers, his around the green play is not going to look as good, but I do think he is genuinely a good short game player. And even with his around the green game being pretty bad, he's made every cut since the Sony Open, and he's had three top 10 finishes in that short stretch. So I really, really do like how Sai the Gala shapes up at Augusta National. Next up, we have Sung J.M., who was a runner-up in the 2020 November Masters in his debut. Since then, he has missed the cut, finished 8th in 2022 and 16th in 2023, where he gained strokes in all four categories in those last two events. This is a deceptively good Masters history for Sung J. Um, he's not a guy that people usually think of or talk about as a guy that plays well at Augusta, but Hey, he, he has been, right? However, he, his recent form leaves a lot to be desired. He has not had a top 10 finish since the century at the start of this calendar year, which includes missing three cuts in that stretch. Normally, he has a very well-rounded game, but he hasn't seemed to put all four categories together for a good finish this year. So Sung J.M. is a true um, guinea pig for recent form versus course history. The recent form is bad. The course history is good. How will that pan out for Sung J.? Now, the opposite of that is, is Tyrrell Hatton. Well, actually, not quite the opposite because his recent form is quite the enigma with it being on live and him never finishing better than eighth. But his course history is quite objectively terrible. Um, he's previously stated that he hates the setup at this course, and that bears out in his finishes. He's never finished better than 18th. In the last two years, he finished 52nd, which I believe was last of all golfers who made the cut, and then 54th in, or 34th in 2023. So uh, just a guy that I'm probably not going to be playing in DraftKings this week, not going to be betting to win this tournament. Um, I think he's another guy that kind of took the bag from Liv. It, it just does not have his game calibrated for um, major championship play right now. And, of course, that he outwardly has said that he doesn't like. He does not check a lot of boxes. Now, Tommy Fleetwood is a guy who is always played – in DFS at major championships by everybody because everybody loves Tommy Fleetwood. Everybody thinks Tommy Fleetwood is eventually going to win a major and he has never won on American soil. So his history here at this event, it was, you know, his best finish was 14th in 2022. That's not exactly promising. He's never had a tournament where he gained strokes in all four categories here. And he's coming in with very middling recent form. He has lost strokes on approach in three of his last four tournaments. And I just, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm kind of willing to let everybody else play Tommy Fleetwood this week, and I'm just going to pass on it. Now, Corey Connors is a guy who nobody talks about but does have great history at Augusta. He had had three straight top 10 finishes in 2020, 2021, and 2022 before missing the cut uncharacteristically last year. And Corey Connors is just one of the best ball strikers on tour. Like when you look on any kind of data site that looks at strokes gained off the teen approach, he is green pretty much in both of those categories for every tournament since the Open Championship of last year. That's really hard to do. His short game is a little bit up and down, particularly his putter, but he actually historically has putted decent here. He did gain strokes putting in that T6 finish in 2022. Um, so basically his path to victory here with him not being very long off the tee is just to out approach everybody else, which he has shown the ability to do. Um, so I definitely think Corey Connors is a little bit of a sneaky pick, sneaky play this week in DFS. Now, Tom Kim is like, I don't even know if it's sneaky. I think it's just like totally under the radar. If there's anywhere, if there's any more under the radar than you could be or anything that you could be under underneath the radar, that would be Tom Kim. He was T16 last year in his master's debut, but he's been objectively terrible since his win at the Shriners in the fall. He's only had one top team, top 15 finish since then, and that was in the DP World Tour Championship, not on American soil. His approach play has just not been as good as it was when he broke out in 2022 and 2023. So I just don't really know if I can trust a guy whose biggest strength is not his strength right now. 
Patrick Reed is next up, and Patrick Reed kind of is a little bit of Brooks Kepka in him, except he's much less likable, in my opinion. Um, we don't really know what to make of his recent form on Liv. It hasn't been good, but he showed last year that even with very poor recent form coming in, he could still show up at Augusta National and contend. He won this event back in 2018, but in the last four editions, he has had three top 10 finishes, which his best was that T4 last year. So he's a guy that is kind of like the anti-Tommy Fleetwood in DFS, where everybody always plays Tommy Fleetwood just because they like him. Nobody plays Patrick Reed because they don't like him. So I think Patrick Reed makes for a very interesting DFS play. And I think that that recent form at Augusta is certainly a really, really positive sign for Patrick Reed. All right, let's take another quick little breather and then we're going to get on with part four. Next up is the chef Minwoo Lee. And the question is, will Augusta National let Minwoo cook, right? Well, he's appeared here twice, finished 14th in his debut in 2022, but missed the cut last year where he had just a dreadful week on approach, losing over six strokes in the two rounds that he played. And this is not abnormal for Minwoo. He has these really up and down weeks with his irons. Um, and his last appearance at the Valspar was a significantly down week where he lost over five strokes in two rounds played. But to me, he just has the game of a guy who's eventually going to win a major championship. He's really long off the tee. He's got a really crafty short game. And Australians tend to play well at Augusta. So if you want to buy into that narrative, then Minwoo checks a few boxes, but the iron play is definitely a big sign of concern. Speaking of concern, Ricky Fowler, um, this is his actual first Masters appearance since 2020. Um, his best finish at Augusta was a runner-up back in 2018, but that was six years ago. And because he hasn't played in each of the last three editions, we actually don't have any broken down strokes gained from Ricky Fowler to know how well he played in any of his um, components of his game in, in the Masters that he played in. Well, it, to me, he kind of has a little bit of Jason Day in him where he had really good recent form, won the Rocket Mortgage in the summer last year, and has been kind of dreadful since. In the calendar year 2024, he has not finished inside the top 30. That is quite troubling, and it's not something that is indicative of somebody who is going to win the Masters. If you were looking for any sign of hope at the Valero Texas Open, he missed the cut this week as well. So Ricky's a guy that I'm just not going to be picking or playing in DraftKings this week. Now, the next two guys I do want to kind of pair together, and that is Justin Rose and Adam Scott, both of whom only really seem to tee it up at difficult events in difficult fields. So their finishes, you got to kind of take them with a little bit of grain of salt. You also got to understand that these are guys that their game is calibrated for major championships. Justin Rose has played this tournament 18 times and he's finished in the top 10, six of them. He's actually been first round leader four times out of those 18. Now he has not been great in 2024, but again, he's playing in tough field events. He really mainly cares about majors at this point. So uh, I would not let that be a concern. Adam Scott is kind of the same way, except Adam Scott is actually playing pretty well at the Valero Texas open right now, but Adam Scott's approach play with the exception of the players a few weeks ago, has been really good in the calendar year 2024. And Adam Scott has actually not missed a cut at Augusta since the year 20, or I'm sorry, 2009. So this is a really good course for Adam Scott. He's another one of these Australians. So Justin Rose and Adam Scott, it would not shock me if on Sunday, either of the two of them were sniffing around the top 10 of the league. Russell Henley is a guy that I like a lot, and I'm hoping that everybody else doesn't notice him because he actually has five straight top 30 finishes at Augusta, which peaked with a T4 last year. He's not super long off the tee, but he's got a great short game, and his iron certainly can get hot. He also played his collegiate golf at Georgia, so he's got a little bit of that local angle. Now, you know, we always have to be concerned with his lack of distance off the tee, right? But he played the Arnold Palmer Invitational, which is one of the longer courses on tour, and finished T4 there. Um, so he can keep up at long courses, is currently playing well at the Valero Texas Open. And so if he continues this run of form at Augusta with his good run of recent form, Russell Henley could absolutely be a guy who could top 10 or win this golf tournament. Another guy who I think has the upside to win this golf term is Siwoo Kim, the former players champion, um, has a major championship track record that is kind of boomer bust, but he booms enough that just makes you think eventually he could win it, right? Like Russell Henley, he does have a verified elite short game, and his history at this event has been pretty solid. He's made the cut at every Masters that he has played since 2018, peaking with 12th place finish in 2021, where his short game really didn't show up, and that that's one of the better components 
of his overall game. And if he's able to, you know, bring his usual short game with his ball striking that he's had this year, then that's recipe for success for Siwoo. He has gained strokes both off the tee and on approach in every single start this calendar year, which is really hard to do. And that is translated into six top 25 finishes. He's actually gained with the putter in his last three stroke or last three appearances at Augusta as well. And the putter is normally the red flag for Siwoo. So I think that Siwoo Kim definitely has his game trending in the right direction heading into this week. The next two guys I'm going to talk about a little bit together as well, Steven Yeager and Nick Taylor. These two guys played their way into Augusta by winning um, a, a tournament here this um this calendar year. Steven Yeager did it by winning the Texas Children's Houston Open, which is a course that requires a lot of chipping off of short grass, which is a skill that you're going to have to have this week. And he actually beat Scotty Scheffler to win this tournament. And there's a lot of really good players who have not beaten Scotty Scheffler at all this year. So you got to give him props for that. Definitely don't mind Steven Yeager. I like his overall game, but you got to be concerned with the fact that he's never played here. Nick Taylor is in a similar boat where he only played in the 2020 November match. Masters and finished 29th, but 2024 has been pretty much the best year of his career. He did win at the Waste Management Phoenix Open, which was a very tough field, very firm and fast conditions, and a lot of champions at Augusta National have played well at that tournament in the past. So um, to me, Nick Taylor is another guy who checks a lot of boxes. His approach play has been outstanding. He has gained at least two strokes on approach in every start in the calendar year 2024, So, except for the century. I uh, forgot about the century. So he's been really good on approach this year. And, and so that really allows him to, to reach uh, his ceiling if his approach play is cooking. Next up is Harris English, who disappointed everybody with a missed cut at the Valero Texas Open because his game had been trending in the right direction. He was coming off of three straight top 21 finishes, but that missed cut really puts a damper on that. Um, in fact, you know, his history at Augusta has been decent. He missed his cut in his debut back in 2014, but since then he has finished 42nd, 21st, and 43rd. Um, I don't really know what to make of Harris English. I, I think a lot of people are going to go to him. He's another guy who played his collegiate golf at Georgia, but to me, the, the missed cut at the Valero Texas Open is definitely a little bit of a red flag for a guy whose game had been trending in the right direction. Next up, we have Cameron Davis, who has played only one Masters, and that was in 2022, and he finished 46, where his short game really let him down, and his driver really let him down, which is not usually the case with Cameron Davis. Now, his um, recent form has been as up and down as it could possibly be, but because it is up and down, it does make me think that on a course where you're not really punished off the tee if you miss a whole lot, he's a guy who could end up playing really well if he's able to put it together for all four rounds. Matthew Pavone um, played his way into this tournament by winning the Farmers Insurance Open back in January, and he followed that up with a third place finish at Pebble the next week, where if you remember correctly, that tournament was actually shortened around, so he very well could have won back-to-back -back weeks on the PGA Tour. Um, he has been not great since, but you know maybe he could bring a little bit of that magic that he had at Torrey Pines over with him um, to Augusta National, and that would be the hope is that he has an absolute ceiling performance like he did that week. If you're looking to draw any kind of comparison, the Farmers Insurance Open Torrey Pines requires a lot of long iron play, which is certainly going to be the case this week at Augusta. So if that long iron play shows up, he's going to give himself a little bit of a chance. Chris Kirk has only played in one match, or I'm sorry, He's played more than one Masters, but it's one recent Masters. Um, he had not played this event since 2016, but he played it last year and finished 23rd. And his lead-in form is actually better right now than it was in 2023. Um, he won the century earlier this year in what was a very tough short field. Um, so that does give me the hope that he can show up and win one of these events. And Kapalua is actually a pretty good comp course here to Augusta National. A lot of elevation changes. It's quite long. There's a lot of undulation and character on the greens. So to me, Chris Kirk does check a few boxes in that way. Speaking of comp courses, one of the uniquely good comps to Augusta National is the John Deere Classic TBC Deer Run. You have seen master champions like Zach Johnson and Jordan Speed win there. Um, it's because of all the uphill, downhill, side hill lies that you end up with at that tournament. And the last two winners of that event are here in this field, JT Poston and Sepp Straka. Now, JT Poston um, has a missed cut and a 34th here at Augusta National, but he has been playing decently well this calendar year. He kind of peaked at the start of the year um, in January, and it hasn't been as good since, but if that iron play that he has 
used as his strength throughout his entire career and his putter, which has also been one of his strengths, show up. And we know he has the ability to hit off of these uphill and downhill lies. JT Poston is a guy who could play well this week. Seb Straka is a guy who's playing a little bit better. Um, he's a little bit more long off the tee. At Augusta National, he's made the cut twice, finished 30th and 46th. He's also a pretty verifiably good long iron player and a pretty good short game player in terms of his around the green long term, but short term, it hasn't been great. So um, he's a guy that if all four facets of his game do end up clicking, Sef Straka is a guy who does bring the upside to win this golf tournament, in my opinion. I think he's one of the better long shot bets to win here at Augusta this week. All right, so that does it with part four. Let's take another quick breather before we do dive into part five. So this is the last segment before we really dive into the deep long shots, but I, I'm still going to go pretty quick through this one because I, I do think there's very minimal chance that all these guys actually win the tournament. Um, so first up for this segment is Ryan Fox, who played in his first Masters last year, finished T26, made the cut in all four majors last year, which is actually um, – not an easy thing to do. Played pretty well in all four of those majors also, you know, finished T26 in the Masters, T23 at the PGA, T43 at the um, U.S. Open, and then T52 at the Open Championship. And really, that's about all that you can say about Ryan Fox is that record in major championships. His recent form leaves a lot to be desired. He missed the cut at the players in the Valspar, followed it up with a T78 at the Houston Open, and missed the cut again at the Valero this week. So with Ryan Fox, you're really banking that his distance off the tee, which is his strength, and his historically decent performances in majors could it turn into a good week here this week. Now, Keegan Bradley is next up, and he has never finished in the top 20 in a Masters that he has appeared in. Last year was the first Masters that he played in since 2019, finished T23. And honestly, last year was the best year of Keegan's career since like when he was a little youngster back in the early 2010s. Um, what's not encouraging, though, is Keegan Bradley's recent form. He has missed cut in three of the last four events. His putter, which was his strength in the summer when he was playing really well, really let him down in each of the last four events. And really, when you think about courses Keegan Bradley plays well at, it's either courses that are short golf courses, par 70s, or courses in the northeastern United States. And Augusta National is none of that. So Keegan Bradley does not check a whole lot of boxes, does not get a whole lot of interest from me. Next up are two guys who were rookies last year on the PGA Tour who, who were really, really promising young players that are, are now debutantes at Augusta, first of which is Nikolai Hoygaard, who has just not been good since his runner-up at the Farmers Insurance Open. He is really long off the tee. He's pretty good with long irons but he hasn't been good with them lately. Eric Cole was the rookie of the year last year on the PGA Tour who did not cash it in for a win. Now, one thing I do like about Eric Cole, though, is – his recent form, as up and down as it's been, has been pretty on track with what we know about Eric Cole. He is not long off the tee. He is not very accurate off the tee. So he's at his best at courses that do not place an emphasis off the tee. And Augusta National is a course that places an emphasis on the second shot as opposed to the first shot. So maybe that could go well for him. He does have a pretty good short game, but I do not think the recent form is great. I do not like the fact that this is his first tournament. And so just not a, a whole lot of interest for me. Adam Hadwin is a guy that I like a lot heading into this week, though. I I, I do. I, I got to be honest. Um, this is his first Masters appearance since 2020, on um, which he did miss the cut. But prior to that, he would finished T36 and T24 in his two appearances. But you can make the argument that he is playing the absolute best golf of his career right now. He has had three top six finishes in the calendar year 2024, where all facets of his game have been working pretty well. He's also a guy who, generally speaking, plays better in more difficult conditions when par is a good score. He's a very good par maker. He doesn't make a lot of bogeys. Um, and so if this Masters does end up playing more difficult, like the people at Augusta National want it to, then that's just another notch in the belt of Adam Hadwin. He is one of my favorite value plays in DFS this week. I'll do, I do seriously wonder if he does have the upside to win the tournament. Next up, I'm going to group two guys together, Eric Van Rien and um, Jake Knapp, because they both won in Mexico to get to this event. Eric Van Rien at the Worldwide Technologies and Jake Knapp at the Mexico Open. But Eric Van Rien is just a terrible major player. He's missed six cuts in a row at majors, which includes a missed cut and a withdrawal at Augusta. He's a great long iron player who does have the capability of getting scorching hot with his irons and his putter, but there's nothing that points to that being this week. Jake Knapp is a 29-year-old rookie who, again, like Eric Van Rien, is a pretty long guy off the tee, is an elite long iron player, can get hot with the putter, but I don't know if it's going to happen in a course that he has never played before. I would have felt a lot more confident about Jake Knapp if the Masters took place right after the Mexico Open or right after the Cognizant Classic. He hasn't really done much to improve his status since then. 
Next up, I'm going I'm to group two more guys together because both these guys got special invites to this Masters, and that is Adrian Moronk and Ryohi Satsune, both of them for their elite play on the DP World Tour last season. Um, Moronk since made the jump to live, and um, I don't really know what to make of his game. He missed the cut in his only appearance at Augusta last year. It's really hard to determine what he's been doing on live. He was great in the swing season in Europe, but I, I just, I don't know, man. I, the missed cut at the Masters, not really playing all that great on live, not but not for me, man. And, and Rio Hisatsune, you know, all those elite level starts that he had on the DP World Tour in, in 2023 just has not translated to a lot of success in, in uh, on American soil. The one good news that he has going for him is that he is a pretty solid iron player in general week in, week out. And so if those irons do get hot, that maybe could give him a chance to make the cut and finish in the top 20 or top 10. Luke List is next up. He is um, the, the captain of Team No Putt. Um, you know, he's generally been one of the worst putters on the PGA Tour since he's been on it. Um, he's only played one Masters as a professional, and that was in 2022, and he did miss the cut that week. But his ball striking has been pretty solid this calendar year, and his putting has actually been pretty solid this calendar year, peaking with a T2 at the Genesis Invitational, which is a pretty solid comp course to Augusta National. Since then, he has missed his last two cuts heading into this Masters, but I don't think that this is the worst spot in the world for Luke List. Next up, we have Thor Bjorn Olsson, aka Thunder Bear, because I'm pretty sure that Thor Bjorn translates into Thunder Bear when you when you put it in English. Um, he is a guy who is playing in his fourth Masters. Um, he has finished. 6th, 44th, and 21st in his three appearances, never missing a cut. Has not played in one since 2019, however. Um, but he was another guy like Hisatsune and Moronk, who was elite on the DP World Tour in 2023. But now that he's come over to America, has just not really had it. He had missed three straight cuts heading into the Laro Texas Open. However, he is currently playing pretty well at that event, so it will be interesting to see where he finishes at that event and what the strokes gain breakdown looks like to see if he could be a solid bet at Augusta National. Emiliano Grillo is next up, who is playing for the first time at the Masters since 2019. I actually made some money off of him when he was a debutante back in 2016. He was one of my value plays in DFS that, that week and finished T17, which is his best finish at Augusta. He has also not fin not missed a cut in the counter year 2024. With Grillo, we know he's not long off the tee. We know he is accurate. He's going to put himself in good spots, and he does have the iron game to cash in on those good spots, um, and he can get hot with the putter. So um, Now, while Augusta does not fit the bill for courses that he normally excels at. He tends to play his best at shorter golf courses because he is shorter off the tee. You know, his consistent play, his consistent cut making ability makes me think he's a very solid bet to make the cut this week. Next up, you have Kurt Kitayama, who is kind of the opposite of that. When he makes the cut, he plays really well, but he doesn't always make the cut. Uh, you know, even at the Arnold Palmer Invitational, an event where he won in 2023, he missed the cut badly here this year. Um, last year at the Masters, he also missed the cut badly. Although when you look at it, he really just had a terrible two days on the greens. He was pretty neutral from a strokes gain perspective in the other categories. So maybe that might be a little bit redeeming. And he is a guy that, like we said, if he makes the cut, he's probably going to be in contention because he has a very high ceiling, but a very low floor. Speaking of which, Gary Woodland is another guy who has the ceiling to win a major championship like he did in 2019, but has just been not great in 2024. Um, at the Masters, his best finish was last year with a T14. And, you know, he hasn't been great in 2024, but like the guy had brain surgery. So like, I'm not trying to like pick on the guy or nothing. That's obviously something that's very difficult to deal with, but he just hasn't been playing great golf. I think it's a good story for him if he ends up playing well, but nothing in the recent form indicates that he's going to play well this week at Augusta. Taylor Moore is a guy that I do think is going to play well at Augusta, though. He is a guy who tends to play his best in the American Southeast. He actually uh, tends to play his best in red states. Whether or not there's any correlation there is to be determined. But anyway, um, he did finish T39 at the Masters last year with a made cut in his debut. He is also, like Emiliano Grillo, made the cut in every single start in 2024. He's got a great short game. He's got a great iron game, which are two things that are prerequisites for winning at Augusta. I think he is one guy down here near the bottom of the board that could absolutely have the upside to finish top 10 in this event. When the putter and irons get hot for Taylor Moore, they get really hot. And so I do think he has a lot of upside here. 
Next up is another guy that I like a lot, which is Austin Ekro. Now, he is a debutant at Augusta, but he is coming in here off of the win at the Cognizant Classic. And he has just been an elite iron player over the last two months. In each of his last four starts, he has gained over 3.9 strokes to the field with his irons, which is not easy to do. Now, the short game is very up and down. The off the tee game is very up and down. But he is a good long iron player who tends to play his best at long courses or courses that play long. So I really do have a lot of um, a lot of optimism for Austin Eckro this week. He's a young guy that I think is going to be um, improving his position in, in the rankings by the end of this calendar year. Lucas Glover, though, is a guy whose career trajectory is going in the opposite direction. Um, he finished T20 at the Masters in 2022, which was his last appearance. But, like, he's played the Masters a ton of times in his career. That feels like the only one you can really go off of because his previous appearance was the 2020 November Masters. And since then, he had not played the event since 2014. He's a guy who, when he won twice in the summer last year, it was because his normally solid ball striking finally found a hot putter. And since then, he's carried that good ball striking, but the putter has left him. Um, I don't really know what to make of it because I don't really have a sample size to know how well he's going to putt on these greens. Next up, we have Denny McCarthy, who is like the opposite of that because he is one of the best putters in the world, um, and he generally does not have a great tee to green game. It is his debut here at Augusta, so we have no idea how he is going to putt on these greens, but generally speaking, I like to fire up Denny when his tee to green game does show positive signs, and it had just kind of been middling so far this calendar year. You know, no finish in the top 20 of this calendar year, but this week at the Valero Texas Open, he's currently second to Akshay Batia as I'm recording this, and if he does end up finishing well at that tournament, it's going to be interesting to see how his TD green game looks. And like I said, when his TD green game is good, that's when you fire up Danny because the putter is always going to be there. Next up, we have Lee Hodges, who is debuting at Augusta as well. Um, he had finished T35 or better in four of his last five starts before missing the cut at the Valero Texas Open. He tends to play his best at long courses, of which Augusta is one. So maybe he has that going for him, but the missed cut at the Valero is definitely a little bit of a red flag. Adam Schenk is coming up next. He's the last one before we get to the long shots. He is a debutant at Augusta. He is coming in off of three straight top 35 finishes, assuming he closes the deal at the Valero Texas Open. He is a guy who has a verifiably good short game. He's pretty accurate off the tee. He's going to put himself in good spots. So Adam Schenk, not a terrible play. And also one of his best performances on the PGA Tour last year was when he finished T9 at the Tour Championship, which might not sound impressive, but like he started that tournament at the very back with, with the starting strokes and climbed up all the way to T9. And that's another course that's in the state of Georgia. It's a decent comp for this one. T4 at the John Deere Classic, which is a decent comp for this one. Um, so I do think that things are looking pretty good for Adam Shank. I think he's a decent value play that you can go to in DFS formats. All right, so now let's go ahead and take a quick breather, and then we're going to talk about the longest of long shots. All right, so when it comes to these long shots, I am going to lump them into a few categories. The first category is recent tour winners who stand very little chance. Um, you have got Peter Malnati who um, won at the Valspar, kind of came out of nowhere. Nothing statistically points to him playing well this week. He's debutant at Augusta, as is Grayson Murray, who won at the Sony Open, has not really played all that great since. It appears that win was an aberration. Camilo Viegas won in Bermuda last year. Very short off the tee, nothing really pointing to playing well this week. And Nick Dunlap, who won as an amateur at the American Express, that event was against a decently tough field, but has not played all that great since then. Next up, we have the champs who have played Augusta time and time again in their career, but stand very little chance here at this event. And that list is going to kick off with Phil Mickelson, who, um, you know, last year, had zero form coming in, rallied to a fourth place finish though, um, you know, to play really well at Augusta last year. And, and, you know, he's kind of that same way this year, no form to speak of coming in, but you know, guys who have won at Augusta before tend to continue to play well at Augusta. So maybe that would be the only hope for Phil Mickelson. Tiger Woods, we just have no statistical data to go off of to know how he's going to play other than the fact that it's Tiger Woods at Augusta national. Sergio Garcia has missed four of his last five cuts at Augusta since winning no real enthusiasm for him. Bubba Watson is another guy that kind of like Phil can come in with no recent form and play well here. Hasn't been great at Augusta recently though. Charles Schwartzel is an interesting one because he actually has made four straight cuts at Augusta, um, which is kind of uncommon because he really hasn't done a whole lot on live. And then Danny Willett has zero recent form to speak of. Um, but he's missed five of the last seven cuts at Augusta since his win. So just not really a whole lot of enthusiasm in any of those guys. Then there's also the amateurs. The amateurs are headlined by Christo Lamprecht, who was actually the first round leader and the low amateur at the Open at Royal Liverpool last year. There's Jasper Stuffs, who won the Asia Pacific Amateur last year. Um, 
Santiago de la Fuente, who is a senior at the University of Houston, who made the cut at the Mexico Open, who actually has a history of making a cut at PGA Tour event. That's that's not terrible. Um, Stuart Hagestad is playing his third Masters. He actually finished 36th in 2017. And then Neil Shimpley, who's very unheralded, was a runner-up at the U.S. Am this past year. And then lastly, there's a group of Masters champions who I think stand zero chance at this event. Zach Johnson, who was T34 last year, which was his best in a long time. Freddie Couples, who made the cut last year, finished 50th, but that was the first time he had done that in a long, long time. And then Mike Weir, VJ Singh, who has missed the last five cuts at Augusta, and then Jose Maria Olathabal, um, that yes, that's how you're supposed to pronounce it, um, who has not played well at Augusta recently and is actually entering his final Masters. So there you have it. That is all of the participants in the 2024 Masters, unless somebody wins their way in on Sunday, the Valero Tex Open. And like I've said, if it's Akshay, you know I love me some Akshay. So anyway, um, that does it for this episode, guys. Hopefully we've been able to give you guys a ton of information that you can use to help fill out your DFS lineups and betting cards for the 2024 Masters. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Come back with us for the course preview as well as the live stream. Um, if you're subscribed, you'll know when both of those come out. And um, like I said, hopefully we're able to give you guys you know, a little bit of a different episode. This was a little ambitious with all the research I had to do. But hopefully I was able to give you guys some help as we look to Augusta National this week. Remember, like the video on YouTube, subscribe if you haven't already, and rate and review the audio if you have not. If you're interested in college basketball, we are going to have a show previewing the national championship coming out tomorrow as well. All right, so that does it for this episode, guys. Thank you guys for listening to this point, and I will see you guys next time.